Welcome to the Autosportradio.com 2023 show. I'm your host, Don Kay, and we are coming to you from Green Street Pub and Eatery, 911 North Green Street in Brownsburg. Tonight's program is presented by the Indy Dental Group. It's uh, Indy 500 veteran Dr. Jack Miller and his wife, Dr. Liz Lewis, have a spectacular practice. If you think you need your teeth checked, I highly recommend you go and see them. They have five offices in the area, so they'll find one that fits you. You call and make an appointment at number 317-846-6125. That's the Indy Dental Group. If you need insurance for anything, your vehicle, home, whatever, you go to uh, VP Insurance. They're located just a mile or so at 5004 West 16th Street, about a mile west of the Speedway. Talk to Mike Pardee or Tom, the number is 317-248-0070. That's VP Insurance and Speedway. And if you like Trans Am, you like vintage Indy cars, you like any kind of race car, SVRA's got it all. So go to their website, auto, uh, svra.com, and check out the schedule. If there's an event within an hour drive, I highly recommend you go. It's a phenomenal event. They bring great cars, great racing, you'll have a good time. My first guest tonight is somebody I'm sure you have read, heard of, seen, or wondered, where is he lately? <laughs> and we'll find out. It's a lot of things have changed, but he is one of the writers and uh, participants and semi-owner of uh, TracksideOnline.com. If you don't have Trackside, you're making a huge mistake to find everything that's going on. Uh, he's here after a little health scare of such He's up and running again. Please welcome Mr. Steve Wittich. Hi, everybody. Good to be back. <laughs> Very nice to be back. Thanks for having me. Now, let us first, as I mentioned, you had a little health setback. Uh, and fortunately, you were aware that it's in your family and reacted very quickly. And here you are. Yeah, here I am. Uh, I had a uh, mild heart attack uh, at the lovely age of 52, um, wow. which is 10 years older than my dad and his dad and his dad. Uh, so I, uh, I was, uh, did a little bit better than them, but uh, certainly wake up call and uh, definitely need to take a little better care of myself. But I, I'm back, I didn't miss too much time. I missed one race and that was it. So I'm back on the road again and um, kind of changed roles a little bit, still doing some trackside online stuff, but uh, also now in, uh, oh, Mr. Page is a former uh, Business. I'm a pit producer for uh, NBC for the uh, IndyCar races. Uh, started the second half of the year, so I've been doing that, uh, back at that, and uh, still writing a little bit, but it's nice to be back and good to see you, Don. Well, I'm happy to see you. I, needless to say, when I saw what had happened to you, I was shocked, to say the least. I'm thinking you're a young kid. I got socks that are as old as you are, <laughs> and yeah, I wear well, them, and I wear them. Yeah, well, genetics suck. Well, that's true. Yeah, <laughs> All right, you are uh, uh, from a respected organization, I think. Uh, you guys are well respected in the paddock, and when you ask a question, you get an answer, and the only thing you put out is the answer to the question you got. You don't dream up something. So yeah. what, what's new and exciting? Uh, well, what isn't new and exciting? There's, what do you want to talk about? There's lots of stuff going on. Silly season, schedule, I mean, it, you name it, it's going on. But. Uh, yeah, we have uh, obviously been busy with with news lately. Um, obviously, the Alex Pillow, uh saga has continued for another year. Uh, I think we'll have a final answer probably within a couple days at the end of the season, but I fully expect him to be back at Canazzi for a couple more years. Um, you know, it's just one of those. Uh, one day we might get part of the story, but right now I don't think we're going to ever really know all the machinations that went on behind the scenes there. He'll get a raise though, how about that? Oh, I'm sure that Mr. Chip, if he wants to keep, will give him a raise. No yeah, doubt. for sure. And uh, his, he started out in getting IndyCar, in the lights, I think, and then into IndyCar with Roger Yashkawa, who might know. Uh, and he's back with him. Is yeah. that gonna cause a problem that he told, uh, he, that he told Zach, I'm not gonna honor my contract? I, I, I don't, yeah, probably, somehow, some way, but I'm not sure, I haven't, you know, none of us have seen what kind of agreement he had with, with Zach, whether it was, you know, signed or verbal, um, and whatever it was, he's, he's obviously out of it, um, or, you know, doesn't want to continue with McLaren. Um, 
I think he probably realized that there's no way for him to get to F1 through McLaren, and he definitely wants, you know, still to get to F1. Uh, he's it's getting a little late for that, but, you know, he's from Spain, his wife's from Spain, all the families in Europe, so he wanted to get back to Europe, but I think he's realized that, you know, getting a paycheck here is better than nothing, so. Good thinking. Now, it was reported today, it came out that uh, Jack Harvey has been released from uh, Ray Hall Letterman. Did you guys see that coming? Yeah, um, we did. It, uh, it's kind of a, it, it sucks for Jack because he just, things never meshed well with that team. And if you remember last year, he had a, had a big hit at Texas and things never really seemed to, to turn around for him. And, you know, I actually expected him to be gone a little bit sooner than he was, but um, I think the team felt a lot of loyalty to him to try and give him a chance to, to show what he can do. You know, we, we know he can drive and it's just a matter of getting the results and, and you know, and it's not like, it, he hasn't been making a lot of mistakes, the, just the pace, that, that car has not had the pace that his teammates have had, and you know, it's a results-oriented business, so that team is looking for results for this finish of the year, and um, Connor's obviously gonna be in the car gateway. Uh, I expect two different drivers in the car at Portland and at um, Laguna Seca. They tested a couple drivers earlier this year, uh, Toby Sowery and Yuri Vips. Um, Toby, obviously, Indy Lights, Indy Next driver. Uh, Yuri Bips, F2, former Red Bull, uh, junior driver, uh, tested with them. And I expect, I expect him at the final race of the season and maybe Toby at Portland. Um, but yeah, then that, that car obviously is gonna be looking for a new driver as well. Is, is there seats or are there seats available for you know, guys coming up from uh, Indy Next? I mean, they've got some good drivers, fortunately, uh, Linus has gotten a ride now, and he's shown that he can drive the car. Yeah. You think there's any seats? Yeah, I think there's going to be a couple spots. Hopefully, um, I really do. I think you'll see, you know, a current Chevrolet team that is owned by a local boy, possibly add another car um, for one of the lights drivers or Indy Next drivers. I'm going to get in trouble. <laughs> with Levi, if I don't get it right, uh, Indian X drivers. But yeah, no, I think you'll see probably two, two or three of the guys on the grid next year. Um, there's going to be a few open seats. So, oh no, Elio has vacated the seat. Yes, and uh, it's now part ownership. Yes, and I suspect he will stick around if they were to put a uh, a rookie in the car that he could be able to guide the two of them because the Tom Bloomquist is obviously going to be a rookie. Yeah, no, I think that'd be, I, you know, I definitely think he's going to be around a lot. Um, it's an interesting what you've seen teams like, like Shank do with, with Elio and what Aaron McLaren's done with Tony is you bring these, these guys in that are, don't get me wrong, they help on the driving side, but they help on the commercial side too. Um, it just takes a little bit of pressure off the current drivers when you have someone like Tony and Elio that you can send out and do sponsor stuff um, instead of the current drivers having to do all of it. So it's, I think you'll probably see more and more teams. You know, Dario doesn't do as much of the, the sponsorship side, but it's still, I think you're going to see a lot more of that within the sport where it just takes a little bit of pressure off the current drivers because there is so much you have to do with your sponsors and on the commercial side as a driver these days that having someone that's been there and done that and that everybody knows is a benefit. You see anything else exciting going on? As you said, it's silly season. I, uh, one of the things, uh, the guy, the drivers that I saw was gonna be one of the leaders, besides Polo, of course, would be uh, Callum Eilat. A lot of people are looking at him, and I know, I'm sure he's not happy with uh, what's going on with Yukos. No, and I, there's there's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes. I think Callum will probably be with Hunkos, but there's some beside, behind the scenes works. We all know McLaren wants to run a fourth car. The current shop they're in, no space for that. They've been talking to a current one-off team that does the 500 and has done the 500 for a long time, and they've been talking to... I think Hunkos and a couple of the other current Chevy teams to sort of partner up and, and give them an ability for a fourth car and then share resources. So I could see Callum actually being in a really good situation there where if that happens, it gives him the opportunity to have the same 
resources as the Aaron McLaren guys if, if they share, you know, the engineering and everything like that. So, yeah, I think that there, there's, there, like I said, there's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes right now, um, just in within the manufacturers and, and trying to work together more and trying to improve. They want, you know, we all know we've got the big teams. Basically, we've got four now. Right? We've got Penske and Ganassi are sort of on their own level, and then you've got Andretti and, and Aero McLaren sort of on the next level. Well, the manufacturers want to bring the Foyts and the Hunkos and the Coins and the Ray Halls up closer to everybody else so everybody's contributing. I think you're going to see a lot more cooperation within the teams within manufacturers going forward uh, to sort of help everybody forward. Well, I, I recall at the beginning of the year, I think they, they came out with a new gearbox cover. They said it was the answer to that, all the trouble. <laughs> yes. And Catherine legged back into the wall and they found out that didn't work real well. I was told they paid ten thousand dollars for it, but they went back to the old one. I said, "Did anybody get checked for ten thousand? <laughs> no, no. Uh, actually, you know what? Though this weekend uh, the uh, the new one was back on the car for the first time. So whatever, they must have figured something out with it. It didn't. Uh, I don't think it deformed the way they expected it to. But it looks. I think it's back on the car now. So um, going forward, I expect it'll be there. And it's it was more put in place for when the hybrid system comes on board next year. Um, that hybrid system, a lot of it's going to be in the gearbox area, so they had to change the, the attenuator and give it a little bit more space back there to begin with. It's sort of a test for next year. What is the hybrid thing going to do? What's it supposed to do? What What's the advantage to having it? It's basically just, it's going to be, you're going to see it used basically as a push to pass. It's going to have more, you're going to have more, that's how you're going to get your extra push to pass horsepower. They'll use it on pit road, um, so it won't be, you know, you won't be, you'll be burning out, but it'll be electric power going out. But it's not, it's not a hybrid system like you see in cars. It's more like what, sort of what you see in F1, where it'll store power and then you can use that power. You know, whether it's an engine map or whether it's pushed to pass, we don't know 100% yet, but I know the testing, they're back testing and it's gone fairly well so far, so. They had problems with the, the first few iterations of it, but I think it sounds like everything's so far going well lately. You think the IndyCar will ever go to all electric? You know, maybe, but I doubt you or I will be around. <laughs> uh, it's going to take, it's just, it's a long way down the road, right? Like, I mean, you look at, you've got to do 500 miles and that's just, on one battery charge, it's not, it's not going to be possible, you know? They've got the... Formula E where it, you know they can do maybe a quarter of what an IndyCar race is now, but it's not there yet and it's not going to be there in our lifetime, I highly doubt. Um, you know, I think we might see them go, there might be other options they can use where, and even what we've done this year with the, the shell with the 100% renewable fuel, you're just going to see more push for stuff like that than you will, I think, the, the pure electric. It's, it's a long way off. Can you imagine running electric cars in the 500? You could talk to the people across right, that'd be pretty the crazy. other side of the track. Yeah, no kidding. If yeah, turn, no. Turn the PA down, it's too loud. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, for me, racing's a lot about the senses, and part of that's noise, right? So oh, sure. I don't want to see it go away, but you never know. What do you see good coming out of the Indy Next Series? I mean, they've got some good competitive drivers. It, it used to be when it first started, there'd be... You know, the lead pack or a couple of cars would lead, you need to wait for three or four seconds for the rest, but now they're all pretty well. Yeah, no, it's it's really competitive this year, and we've got, we're back up to, you know, 18, 19 cars full time, which is a huge benefit. And, you know, we've got a team based here that's running eight or nine of them, HMD. <laughs> um, but I think you'll see probably a few more added next year. And, and we're starting to see, you know, you've obviously got Andretti running in, in IndyCar and Hunkos running in IndyCar. And, I expect you'll see HMD somehow running an IndyCar. It's, you're going to see more of that where it's the teams are using it. Like everybody else these days, getting people to work is hard. And, you know, having a team to bring them up from is, is, a, is a huge benefit, right? You've got, you can tra train people on racing and going to eight events a week or a year instead of, you know, 20, and they get used to it. And, you know, it's just, it's a benefit for the drivers and the crews for, for the IndyCar teams. It seems to me a couple of years ago when IndyCar tailed down to 
14 cars or so, a lot of the mechanics were out of jobs, so they'd go on to other series. Now they can use them and they don't have them. Yeah, no, it's definitely, uh, there's definitely a need for, to, to get younger people into the sport. Um, it's tough, uh, you know, it's just, a lot of people don't want to travel as much, and you know, the, the training's not there, right? Like, you look at what, they don't need as many, you know, when we have our personal cars don't break down the way older cars did. So you don't train the mechanics even at the uh, dealership level and those guys don't then move up. So you've got less people at the dealership level, less mechanics there. So it's just it's just a matter of, honestly, personally, IndyCar needs to start, you know, like a school where they train their own mechanics. That For me, that would be the smart thing to do or to, to partner with, you know, an Ivy Tech or someone like that where they can br then bring mechanics up. The old day Cam? Yeah. Remember Cam? Yep. Yeah, exactly. Well, uh, Danny White at Purdue did that. He's got several people that are working for Andretti and a couple other teams, but they told him he was too old. He had to retire. So now that's he's out of that, and I guess uh, IUPUI or PU or whichever one it is mm -hmm. is working on a program. But you're right, and that was his idea, was to train yeah. these kids so that they get into it and get them jobs as interns with the other te with teams right yeah it's tough right now it's you know everybody's always looking for mechanics and, and reliable mechanics and people that show up to work on time and you know <laughs> it's not you, when you travel you're on your own you've got to take care of yourself you know like it's it sounds silly but you know having the guy that's there when the garage opens at seven is important right and, you know it's it, it just people need to be trained and, and used to exactly what to expect. Well, I have to confess, when I first came here in 1964, I think it was, 63, 64, I thought the cars backed off the trailer and went out in the track and went <laughs> Yeah, right. But I find out real quick that's a bunch of booty. Yeah. Because a exactly. lot of cars that come off the trailer go in the garage take them apart. I'm thinking, yeah. why didn't you put them apart and put them together <laughs> when you get here? But uh, So there is a lot of work, a lot of hours invested, and you think the car's not that big. No, how much but time? Can, but it takes a lot. Takes a lot of time. Yeah, there's a lot it really into does. it. And I think also, today's kids can't work on cars like we did. I mean, no, you they can't. Up, you, right? take a, you go buy another plastic one and bolt one and put the other one on it. And you know, that's true. But you know, it's interesting. My wife is a high school teacher at Pike, and she said the kids now, the kids the last few years are starting to get back into cars a little bit more than, you know, the the kids that are in their early 20s now, the kids that are 15, 16 are actually a little bit more interested in cars than they had been, so maybe we'll, we'll get a turnaround on on that. I can only hope. Yeah. Well, yeah, well, if you're a computer genius, you can work on a car. You can't true. change the points like we used to and all right. that other stuff. That yeah, they don't let do. you anymore, right? No. You can't let them touch your car anymore. Yeah, so, um, how, do you, how do you see the series? Do you think the series is going as it should? That it's growing as it should. The car count is obviously up, up, and it would be nice to see one or two more next year. But then, some of the tracks are going to have a problem because they don't have room for 28 or 29 pit stalls. Yeah, no, I think it, racing in general is kind of taking a bit of a turn back to the the positive side for sure. Um, you know, I think you've seen it on, on pretty much every series where, and I think it's just it's a matter of learning how to market to the younger generation and and. You know, it needs to be, for, for us a lot of times it was the cars, right? We, and we love the drivers, but the cars. Now, I think you really have to hit on the personality side of, of people. Um, that sort of be, seems to be the way, the way things are and the way kids like to, you know, the, the reality shows are, are the big thing, right? So it's, it's just keeping them engaged on the human side of things. And, you know, we like a 500 mile race, but and you're, you're never going to see the Indy 500 go away, but maybe we could get onto something where, you know, we have two short races a weekend or something like that, where where it's in an, it's in a one hour time window where people can watch it for an hour and that's it. Um, you know, you're going to always want to have a couple premier events, but we're at the point where everybody's, you know, busy, right? Exactly. And they're, you know, it's just everybody's busy and everybody doesn't have time to, to sit down for two and a half or three hours. So there's a point where maybe you do it, you know, in, you have it over two days where you have an hour on one day and an hour on the next day. And, um, you know, I just, you've watched sort of what F1's done with the, with their, you know, their qualifying races. And I think that, that it brings a little bit more interest, right? You just, 
you spread it over a bit more time and you hit a few more people. So I think one day that's something we're going to have to look to. I don't see anything changing anytime soon. Well, one of the other uh, keys to the silly season is uh, uh, Marcus Erickson. What do you think is going to happen with him? I don't know. That's a, that's He's definitely the one that the rest of everything, everything hinged on Pelot, but that was more, uh, you know, he was going here or there. Marcus, I know Marcus did get an offer from um, Chip that was a, a good offer, but I don't know if it was a, too little too late. Um, you know, I think I've, I've, se I, I've seen him talking to Michael Andretti a lot over the last six months or even three months. And so, you know, I think that's an option for him as well. Um, Marcus is going to get paid, which Marcus deserves to get paid. Um, is he going to get paid as much? Well, no, definitely not. But, um, you know, Marcus, I could, it, there's, it's not out of the realm of possibility that both those guys are back at, at Ganassi next year. Like, it could happen, um, which then leaves Andretti with a couple, possibly one spot to fill. I'm not sure. Grosjean's another one. I'm not sure what he's going to do yet. Um, for a while, I thought he was going to go, but I think he might come back for another year. Um, he has some opportunities, though, with some sports car stuff. Um, the Lamborghini prototype program, I think, is, is interesting to him, but I think he'll be back for one more year. I assume they've got to have a good sponsorship because they can't spend a lot of money repairing cars. <laughs> yes, yes. He's been better. The last, uh, the last three or four races, he's kind of settled in a little bit. Um, but, yeah, no, he need, it's, it's been too bad because he's got a lot of pace. And it's just a matter of, you know, it's kind of been his MO throughout his career is that, there's a lot of speed there, but there's, you know, he's expensive. Dents. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of dents and bumps yes. and dents. I think uh, it's interesting to me the number of Formula One drivers. In fact, Jensen Button was here and ran the NASCAR yes. thing. The drivers that are coming in the IndyCar and the ones that I've talked to that have come here say this is much more fun. It's more competitive. In Formula One, there's two or three guys that win. That's it. Here, everyone, with a couple of exceptions, have a shot at winning. Yeah, no, it's even even you look at the guys that, that come into Indy next and USF Pro 2000, the, the European kids that come over here, and they have so much more fun. It's just a different atmosphere. It's more family oriented. It's not so cutthroat. Um, everybody has a fair chance. Um, something with what and something that Dane Anderson and IndyCar has done a good job with Indy next is it doesn't matter what team you're driving for or if you're the first or the sixth or the whatever HMD has ninth driver on that team, you have a chance to win. In Europe, in the junior categories, there's one good team and there's one good driver on that team and he gets all the benefit or she gets all the benefit. And it's, it's different here and that's, the kids that come over love it and they absolutely love that they, they can be competitive right off the bat and everybody gets treated exactly the same, which is, I think it's awesome. Do you think? Uh, do you think that there? Uh, you know, the, the one that I think uh, kid I had here actually, Jacob Abel, very, very interesting kid to say the least, um, has done reasonably well. And I finished fourth again this at, at uh, yep. Speedway, um, and he started. I hope he started. Started way in the back. Yeah, I think uh, he started eighth this weekend. Yeah, and he finished fourth. Yeah. So he, he's got it, and I think he's got it probably another year before his dad and he move up. So I, I think know, so. I don't know if they'll have uh, uh, R.C. Enerson for another year at the Speedway. And, you know, I know they're working to try and get full-time next year, yeah. and I think Mr. Abel would love to do that. I think so, for sure, yeah. No, I think that's that's another, you know, Indy Next team that I look at, and I go, well, they're going to be an IndyCar team one one day one at one point. And I think they're doing it the right way, uh, not jumping into anything. and. Um, Jacob's done really well. Jacob didn't start racing till he was, I think, 16. So, you know, considering he's probably four or five years again behind a lot of people he's racing with, he's done. He's really good and he's really measured and um, really consistent. And I think his skills are going to translate well to once he gets to IndyCar. Yeah, I think you're right. And I think, uh, as you said, I think some of these junior junior F2000 series and the Pro 2000 series are training drivers correctly, but the interesting thing I find is when they go from next, Indy Next to IndyCar, they say the IndyCar is easier to drive. The Indy Next car is not easy to drive. It's not an easy car to drive at all. Um, moves around a lot. Um, it's it's a little squirrely under the brakes. It's a little bit different with the, the Firestone tires this year. Um, 
a little bit less movement, but no, it's definitely not an easy car to drive, um, which is a good thing. Um, it actually it trains the drivers really well on, on you know what to expect when they move up and um, you know when it's easier at the IndyCar level that's probably a good thing uh, at least it feels easier it's never easier but it, it feels easier to them yeah well when you realize at the end of the straightaway be it and going into turn one or turn three when you're going 235 miles an hour <laughs> yes Colin Heidi that's moving yes. pretty well yeah it is yeah that's the biggest difference when you talk to the guys that move up they're like they did this. You'll never get used to that speed difference. You know, you might be going 180 in an Indian X car, going 230 in an Indian car. It's a big difference. You notice a huge difference. And I, I, I've always found it interesting that, and, and you know, guys that are coming over from Europe have never run an oval. Once they run them, they love them. They enjoy it. They really like it. Most of them like the short tracks, like Iowa and. Uh, yeah, the it's it's there. definitely interesting to see um, uh, because it's. Oval, they don't, they think the ovals are, you know, mash your foot down and, and turn left four times and that's it. But there's a lot of thinking behind it and a lot of them actually really enjoy that. You know, you've got people like Marcus Erickson and, and, and Christian Lungard who are, are really sharp kids and that thinking part of it is really important to them. Like they, they enjoy that part of it a lot and it gives them a chance to, to work with an engineer and, you know, sort of work and make the car work to what they feel comfortable with. I've always found it interesting that you can set a car up for driver A and driver B will say, let me take your car, let's tell him to take the car out. He gets out of it and says, how in the world do you drive this thing? The difference in what drivers like and car setup is quite amazing actually. Yeah, it really is. Um, and you'll get a lot of guys from Europe um, aren't comfortable driving a car with that, that's loose. Um, where the rear end is not secure and once they figure out that that's how they need to go fast on an oval they'll get comfortable quick but it takes a little bit um, and you get guys that never like Sebastian Bourdais fantastic driver just n just hates having a loose car absolutely detests it would rather have uh, a lot of understeer and you know on an oval that's not comfortable so um, as we saw what happened to him in what is it turn two whatever year that was um, so yeah, no, it, it's just something they need to get get used to. But yeah, even you know guys that have been trained over here, they drive cars differently. Um, not a huge difference, you know. When they talk about their teammate has a completely different setup, okay, yeah, maybe, but it's by you know tenths of percentages and and you know tenths of millimeters that yeah. that the change is. It's not huge, but it makes a big difference to them. Oh, you notice when they come in for a pit stop, oh, they made a wing change, they turned their thing. It does. A it doesn't, doesn't, yeah, move, doesn't, much do, at doesn't all. move much at all, it makes a big really, difference. Yeah. But it does, it affects yeah. the handling of the car. Well, one thing about Marcus Erickson, I'm sure is here to stay because he bought a house here now. Yes, he did. Yeah, he so just he bought, a, bought a house. Um, and um, Felix Rosenquist just bought a house too. So a um, bunch of guys are making, putting down some roots here, which is kind of fun to see, right? It's, it's good for the community to have them around. Do you think Felix will stay at Arrow? I think there's a good chance he does now, mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> I'm not sure. It just depends. I don't, I'm not sure if he if he had a deal beforehand. He I know he had opportunity. He had options with. I'm gonna guess Ray Hall, Shank. There were a few people that were interested in him. So uh, he's a really good teammate. Uh, I know feel or I know Pato really wants to keep him as a teammate because he just he's a good teammate. Um, everybody likes him, and he's a good enough driver that that he helps everybody on the team too. Well, Pato was. All that thrilled with his performance this weekend with the handling of the car and so forth. He was yeah, that thrilled. team, it's been interesting to watch them this year. Um, they're, I think the cars are a little easier to drive. Um, they aren't on edge like they have been, but they aren't nearly as quick either. So it's been interesting to watch those guys kind of try and adapt, adapt to, to the change in the car. It's got a, it's got a wider window for them now, but it's, it's not as fast on the top end, especially in qualifying, as, as they'd like, so they'll get there. Uh, good engineering group there, so they will eventually get there. It's just a matter of, you know, adding a third car is a lot, um, and they've done a good job at, at staying competitive. Um, wouldn't shock me to see them win a race here, one of the last three. Well, I think uh, Mr. Uh, Rossi would certainly like to be the guy to do that. Oh yeah, no, ad, no fans or buts about it, but um, and he's fit in well at that team, which is kind of cool to see. It's kind of fun to watch um, those three guys actually get along really well, which is a big part of 
part of being successful these days. You have to be able to work with everybody. And he brought his strategist with him, Brian Byron, yep. who does his way around a race car. N yeah, just a little, yeah. yes. Yeah. So I think uh, that's setting up well. With the number of uh, three guys that have left uh, Arrow McLaren, do you think it's because a team they don't like, or a team's too big, or they want to do something else? Yeah, really I think it's a little bit of a little bit of a mix of both. Um, you know, Billy Vincent, who is uh, sort of their director of competition, I think is the name they give him. Sort of the chief mechanic, um, Felix strategist. He's been running a, a kart team for quite a while, um, and he actually runs. It's Will Powers Karts is who basically they run. And he's, uh, he runs, he ran Sebastian Weldon, he's running Oliver Weldon, he's about 15 kids he works with, and I just think he wants to do that. Um, I wouldn't be shocked to see him get into like a road dandy type team too. He really likes working with the kids. So I think for him it was just time to, you know, he's been on this, doing this for a long time, and you know, been with Penske, and now he's been with uh, Arrow for quite a few years. And I think he just wants to, uh, to make, just wanted to make a change. And the other people that left are, are commercial people, and I think it just, they wanted a bit of a change. They've been there with Sam and, and um, for quite a while. So I think I'm going to guess that uh, Zach has some former JMI people, that uh, just marketing people that he uh, he might be able to bring in that uh, are familiar with how he works. Well, having the two Weldon boys, I know one of them's got a contract with uh, Mike and Andre. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I expect to see him in USF Juniors next year. He's, I think, second in Skip Barber right now. Um, second behind uh, Townsend Bell's kid, Jackson, is uh, leading that championship. So uh, I expect both those kids will be in USF Juniors next year, uh, which is kind of cool to see the now second, third generation come up. Yeah, and I think uh, that that will be huge for the sport. I know when, when we lost him, we lost a huge guy. Yeah, uh, for sure. Yeah, and they're good. They're both really good drivers, too. Yeah. So I don't expect to, yeah, they are not no slouches. So. Well, they inherited something from Dan, yeah, for, for sure. sure. And I remember the first time that Dan came here to test, he tested with uh, Panther, I believe it yep. was. And I yep. was out there watching, and he got out of the car and he's talking. I thought to myself, this kid gets it. He knows what he's here for and what he's doing. Yeah. I invited him on the program, and some people said, who you got next week? I said, Dan Weldon. Who the hell is that? <laughs> you just wait. Yeah, exactly. And obviously. He did well for himself. Yeah, just not too bad. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, do you think next year will be a more exciting year? It, it can't get a whole lot more competitive. I noticed that the Grand Prix first through tenth was like uh, three or four tenths of a second. Yeah, I don't – this is the first time since, I think, 105 that we'll probably have a champion crown before the finale. So I expect it to get a little bit closer again next year. Um, it's been interesting to watch. I'm not going to say Penske's struggling, but Penske is not Penske right now, and we all know that's not going to last. That Roger won't put up with that, and Tim won't put up with that. So um, they're good. They're really good on the ovals. Uh, they just lost a little bit on the street and road course, and I fully expect that to to, to turn itself back around. And um, yeah, I think you'll see Andretti is is making strides. Um, Aaron McLaren's going to be be there. Uh, it's been good to see Ray Hall make some steps forward too. They uh, brought in someone from F1, Stefano Sardo, uh, to run that uh, team, and he's. It takes a while, and they struggled at the 500, but everywhere else they've started to put it together, and it's just a lot of it's on the process side of things. He's an engineer, and and just the steps he's putting in before each race are, are finally starting to pay off, and. With the lack of testing, it's so hard for a team to, to make up where they've lost during the season. So it's, it's been impressive to see the strides that they've actually made. So, well, It should be an interesting season. And the, the fact that it's not over yet, there could be some good, interesting racing upcoming. I thought the GP was a good race television-wise uh, when uh, DeFrancesco passed. <laughs> That'd be Ray impressive. Hall. They, fo they followed him, and then, yeah. when, and then he started going back. They were still had the camera on. I'm thinking, yeah. what are you watching? He's yeah. in fourth. Yeah. What's the big deal? <laughs> yeah. And at the end of the race, they only followed uh, uh, Scott and uh, uh, Graham, Graham yeah. and didn't see what was going on behind him, which was still some good racing going on. Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah, yeah it's interesting when we've got a championship, like sort of someone's run away with it. it it's going to be different for us. I think it changes things. That you get, you sort of, when you've had five or six guys in the championship, 
hunt, you've sort of, the last five or four or five races of the year, people don't want to take chances or do anything silly or that. And now you've got, I think you've got guys just, you'll see some crazy strategies. You'll see some people making bonsai moves because it doesn't matter, right? Like you like what's the difference between fifth or eighth in the championship? Nothing, right? So guys are going to be going for wins, which I think can be really entertaining. Yeah, I think Scott still has a shot. He wins two of the races, and all of a sudden it's awful tight. Oh, for sure. Yeah, no, I think it's still very, very outside shot now. It's yeah, what they still you never know. Shot. Yeah, no, you know, it, no, you never know. And with his ability to save fuel and manage tires and bike haul behind the microphone, they're a tough combination to beat. It, that performance by everybody on that team Saturday was incredible. That was vintage Dixon and vintage nine team and I mean like he, I didn't think he'd be able to save enough fuel not a chance um to get to to manage to I, I it was there was no way I thought anyone could if they pitted before lap, lap 10 there was not a chance they were going to get home he pit lit on pit on lap five and made it with no problem so <laughs> I, and he still went fast that's the main thing right like he still goes fast when he saves fuel it's incredible he knows how to do it yeah well. he does well, I'm glad to see that you're up and around and, uh, and healthy, and I'm sure you're watching yourself very closely. Yeah, I am. Yeah, yeah I, sure. I'm trying to eat better and go for walks and, you know, you trying to do all that stuff. Well, you don't get enough walking at the racetrack? Well, yeah, but <laughs> the other days, yeah. Yeah, that was my problem. I'd get home and I wouldn't do anything for three days, and now I go out for a walk every day. So. Well, glad to see you up and well and look forward to talking to you again. Thanks sure. for your time. Thanks for having me on. That's always we'll see you guys later. Okay, Steve Winnich. Well, no, you have it to me. And do yourself a favor. If you have not subscribed to Trackside Online, you need to do it. $22 a year. And if you want to know what Penske's doing, you want to know what Ed Carpenter's doing, you want to know what the teams are doing, their PR, they got it. If you don't get the stuff from the, from the teams, they do. And you can see it. It's only 22 a year. Subscribe. TracksideOnline.com My next guest is a gentleman that Everybody in this room and around the world has heard of, seen at one time or another. Besides being a, a world-class broadcaster, he's an author of a very, very successful book. And before I forget, with age and lapse of memory, he is now a member of the IMS Hall of Fame. So it was Thank you. He was postponed one year because everybody had the sniffles, but he's in officially. He's a Hall of Famer. Please yeah, welcome Mr. Paul Page. Hi, everybody. Yeah, that that was more than God. Well, you know how big a shock that was for me. Oh, I mean, you know, it, it's not something that you expect, and you get this call. Come over to the museum. We got a ring for you. It's like, oh, I got a ring. <laughs> no, you don't want this one. <laughs> so. Yeah, that, that was very, very special. Uh, and and I, I dare say well-deserved. Now, what I forgot to mention is you have started in radio, got brought into the racing world from, with Sid Collins. Mm -hmm. uh, you did races all over the country and perhaps all over the world. Amongst your broadcastings on your, on your resume is, I did the Nathan's Hot Dog Contest. Wow. When Kobayashi was winning, Paul was there. When Joey Chestnut <laughs> took over, Paul was there. So you know, there's, there's a long list of those. <laughs> Here, here's the deal. Like at, for, at, when I was involved, a network television contract is like 26 events a year. That's the way they generally set them up. So you're doing IndyCar or something, that doesn't pull up the whole 26, does it? So in my case, uh, a couple times they tried me on the NFL and on, uh, and, and on uh, college football. I was like the you know the fourth team down that's going to maybe one market maybe two but I got all these really cool events like I was sent to Budapest to cover the Rubik's Cube World Championship held at the Opera House you know and this was this was when it was still the Soviet Union too so there's a lot of blockades but I, I've got a whole list of those kind of events Nathan isn't the only one well Nathan I, I wanted you to be able to expound on your your travels and your, with a microphone and a te television camera in front of you. But that, to me, that speaks to the fact that you are a broadcaster. When you were coming up as a young kid, did you want to be a, I want to be a broadcaster, I want to be in radio, I want to be in television, or did you say, I'm going to be a mechanic for Joe Schmutz down the corner? 
I actually, I actually was split there. In high school, I really wanted to be in radio. I was part, I went to Highland Park High School, you're wearing Lombard there, Highland Park, Illinois. Um, and we had a uh, Saturday high school radio show at uh, WKRS in Waukegan, which had a big plaque on the wall that said, member of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway Radio Network. And I thought, now that's kind of combining a couple of things that I like. But then I decided I was gonna be a disc jockey. And, and that didn't work out. So I finally, uh, I finally got a good start in news with Fred Heckman and Luke Palmer and the guys at WIBC. They taught me the craft, and, uh, and you know, just it went along. It, as you know, it is not really an easy craft to follow. There's a lot of people pick up a microphone and 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 think they're doing a good job, and I. I I'm not trying to either build myself up or be critical of anybody else, but it is difficult. All the planning, all the preparation, all the things you have to have in the back of your mind. So it takes a lot of training. In my case, I had Sid Collins, the best friend, who was my mentor, and he gave me the, the, the master's degree, if not the doctorate in broadcasting. But we were going out and having dinner almost every night. We talked constantly. and. So I, I learned a lot there. It seems to me at one point, one of your first appearances at the Speedway, he kind of criticized what you did. I remember a story about that. Well, what was that? Him, he wouldn't criticize me. What did I do wrong? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> if he was here, I'd ask him, but I can't, so I don't know. I just remember you saying something. He called you in one day and made some comments about, well, here's what you need to improve on. Yeah, and one of them was interviewing. Okay. Uh, he had... Um, I'd gone out, I was with WIBC, and so was Sid, he was the sports director there. And it was a Saturday, and I went out to the Soapbox Derby Hill to cover the Derby. And did an interview with the winner, was really proud of that interview, radioed it back to the station, and drove back, knowing that Sid was there, and think, oh, this is, I've done it. I walk in the building, he's standing in the lobby with his arms folded. <laughs> and he looks at me, and he says, that is the worst interview I have ever heard. <laughs> you know, okay, I'm part of the tax coming right now. But what that got me was, he sat me down and taught me how to interview and spent a lot of time on how to interview. And, and so, you know, some, some bad leads to some good. Listen, if you got some time, what I, could you help me with how to do interviews? I could use some help. Oh, no, no, you, you, you're pretty damn good. Yeah. <laughs> you're really good, actually. What are some of your best moments? Now, you've spent quite a number of years in the booth as the voice of the 500, which to me, when you can put that on your resume, that goes right to the top when they see that. What are some of your best memories, some of the best races you saw, some of the best interviews you did, and the drivers that you found were either goofy or really good to talk to, or so forth? Well, um, you just mentioned one of my favorite drivers in Dan Weldon. Yes. Um, oh, yeah. And, and just question. a quick, quick story about him. When uh, he was driving for Rick Klein, Klein Tools, we went to um, uh, down to St. Elmo's the night before the race. Rick, Dan, Rick's wife, and me. And you didn't take your wife? Uh, I don't think so. You had to bring that up. I'm sorry. And she may not have even known. <laughs> All right. So anyhow, Rick suddenly starts looking at Dan in a strange way. You know, kind of and I, I, I don't know what's going on here. And so finally Rick says, is that one of our t-shirts you're wearing? Yeah, kind of a hesitant answer. Geez, it, it doesn't really look like it. He said, well, I don't really like the t-shirts that you guys <laughs> supply, so I changed the logo around, had it embroidered. I think it looks a lot better this way. <laughs> <laughs> Night before the 500, and we're talking about how the embroidery is. He won, by the way, the next day, so that was, that was cool, too. Um, moments. My first uh, race uh, as the anchor, um, calling AJ's fourth win. Um, that was super. Um, <laughs> that's when we had the, um, the car come up just in front of the old control tower, and he's sitting up there on, on the wreath and everything, and he pulls off those black leather gloves that he wore. And he kind of looks up. I think he's looking at me. And he throws those gloves. And I'm like, what a great gesture. You know, he's, he knows it's my first race and all that. What I didn't realize was 
the queen and her court are on the next level down, sitting outside. So I, I finally figured out it wasn't me that he was really excited about. <laughs> um, Mira's John Cock uh, was, I think, the pinnacle moment for the Indianapolis Motor Speedway radio network as a broadcast, where we knew what the, what the closure was, Rick to Gordon, and we, we finally said, we're just gonna, we're gonna keep working on that, that closure. Because projecting it, they're gonna be side by side on the white flag, which is exactly what happened. But the team, they were following that, they were working at everybody bringing their own little element into it. And on that last lap, um, one, I can hear where the cars are just by the crowd. Um, but the, those guys were all over that. And you know, that was, I think to this day, that's probably the best piece of audio tape that you're gonna find on the call of a race. Or they have other good ones, but I think that one was really special. Um, let's see. I liked, um, I liked my Al Unser Jr. Um, um, Fittipaldi call um, because I didn't. We'd seen the, those two cars go side by side, lap after lap after lap, and I finally decided with, I think it was 10 laps to go, it doesn't need me. You've got a picture. You have a magnificent picture of those two cars. You know what they're doing. What can I add to that other than get in the way? And so I just, I backed out, and I had the other announcers back out. I might say something like, there's seven miles to go, and I let it. And of course that allowed, when they actually got together in turn three, now I have something that I can really get on top of. I just, I like that I did it that way. I was, that just, that felt good to me. It's, it's a personal liking, but I, re I was really proud of that. You know, it's, it's interesting how, <clears throat> Something like yourself, when you, you know, how you got to the top of, the, of your craft, uh, and uh, people don't realize the hours it takes to get there. I know Scott Goodyear will still credit you with what he was able to do as a broadcaster for 16 years. Yeah, I'm going to have to pay him again, though. I yeah, think well, that's running out. I think that's why he told me again. Uh, but he said that, I said, you know, how did you and how did you and Paul get along? He said, well, let me tell you. We'd leave the track and we'd be driving, we'd rode together, we'd be driving up and, and uh, Paul would say, the green flag is out and so-and-so's in the lead and uh, they're going into turn one, take it. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, going back from the track, you did the same thing. You'd start off with a part of the race and then throw it to him. Well, we were working on one on pacing, when he should, should get in there because um, I'm a big one for not over narrating anything. It's television. The primary medium is the picture, not what the announcer says. Our job is to complement that picture. So um, we were looking for getting a pacing back and forth with Scott, and also what might be an appropriate comment to make. Uh, you know, what are you looking for that you want to comment on? You don't want to be Sam Posey with a sheet of paper of things you want to say and just say them whether they connect to what you're looking at or not. Um, I, I love Sam. He and Bobby, that's, that's another 25 shows for us. <laughs> but yeah, it, uh, we, and we worked a lot on that and uh, how to react to certain things and certain elements. And, and he worked really hard on it and got very good. One thing he said that he, he got a lot of complaints about, particularly from the broadcasters, not from the audience. Every time you, you talk about what oversteer is or understeer, what being loose means, and his response was, there's somebody watching that doesn't have a clue what we're doing. And they got to explain to them what you're talking about. Just like it, it's, I used to watch soccer a little bit when they'd explain stuff and they could see the ball going, they, now they don't say anything. I have no clue what they're doing and I don't understand the rules so I don't follow it anymore. Well, I always, I always thought in broadcasting that that's part of the job we're doing. While we're trying to appeal to the, the, the connoisseur, the, the fan that really knows it's racing, but at the same time, we're trying to bring the new fans in. Right. So we can't just use words as assumptions. Um, the simple one thing would be, well, the yellow's out, they're gonna slow down, they're gonna maintain position, but that's not a good example. But there, there are similar moments where you, you have to help educate that fringe audience that's deciding whether or not they're gonna be race fans. I got it. I have a, I have a Scott Goodyear story. Can I? Can sure, I of course. <laughs> Scott he's Goodyear. Here, he's not here now, so. Oh, I hope he's listening. Uh, <laughs> he um, 
had this thing. I could never find him on Sunday morning before the race. He'd show up for the production meeting and then he'd disappear. Okay, and I thought, oh great, he's out doing the research, getting the stories. And then I find out what he's really doing is trying to find somebody who has a business jet that's flying back to Indy <laughs> that he can get a ride. That was, that was Sunday morning before the start of the race. So I watched that for maybe five or six races. And to show you that he does have a great sense of humor, I went down to Roger and I told him about it. And I said, what I'm gonna need from you is a letter addressed to me that gives me access to your jet. And he writes up a doozy. And uh, you know, signed it Roger Allen Fischel, Penske Racing Stationery, and it just basically said, Paul, I understand you're having trouble getting home from the races on occasion, and you have access uh, to my uh, my either one of my jets uh, anytime you want. Just 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 call. I forget who it was to call, but it was. It looked so cool. <laughs> so Scott would sit where you were, and I took this letter and I kind of slid it under the edge of a couple of things on my side, and so. Here comes Scott in the booth, ready, he's sitting down, he's looking, and he, and pretty soon he's like, and he reads it, and you can see he's just, he believes it, he absolutely believed it, and I let him go about 30 seconds, then I started laughing so hard he knew the, that I'd messed with him. <laughs> <laughs> now, among all your other accomplishments, <clears throat> you have found that you can actually understand and put things in a sentence that makes sense. Really? Yeah, I, I was surprised myself. Yeah, me too. I'm, I'm surprised. <laughs> no. I, I, I was told uh, that you had about five proofreaders so they could correct your English and so forth, but your book. I had a great co author, John Elrod. Yes. And your book has been very successful. It has been. And, and, uh, and you don't have any books left? It's all sold out? No, I, I, I don't. You called and you said, well, bring some books along. And I had to tell you, I. I don't actually have any. We're waiting on another shipment to come in. Oh, so oh. Um, I'm pretty proud of that. And I, I hope that people were satisfied uh, because I, what I tried to do is I thought the last really good history of the Indy 500 was Al Blemker's 500 miles to go. Mm -hmm. That ended in 1959. It was, it was an excellent history. 1960 was my first race. So I thought, all right, we're going to write this starting in 1960 and recount some of the racing aspects of it and that's the frame that we're going to hang the stories on of what then went on with me and the stories that I wanted to tell and it, it seems to have worked out. I, I, I'm surprised how many people have said well I, I, I really couldn't put it down and I don't, I don't think they're trying to be nice. I thought they were very sincere. Oh, absolutely. I read it. I couldn't put it down. Good. Uh, found it very interesting. Are, are, you, are you able to sit down and write again and write another book? Yeah, I, I can. Uh, whether or not I should is another question. Uh, <laughs> there's, there are a lot of narrative stories. I've just told you two of them mm -hmm. um, that I think would be nice in a book, too. And, and I... I have, I have a list that's probably 50 topics long, minimally, uh, of just little stories like Dan Weldon and those things that I've seen and things that I've been involved with, and just fun, humorous things that, that to me is part of what makes racing so pleasant to be a part of that community. I agree with you. I think, in my mind now, football gets a lot of coverage and so forth. Uh, but let's face it, if, if a guard or a tackle misses a block and they knock the quarterback down, he, he might be sore, but he would like to get up. If a mechanic lets a wheel fall off the car, now your driver can have a problem. Or if they do something. So it's a, to me, it's a more close-knit, everybody has to do their job in order to keep the guy steering the wheel safe. Whereas in football, or baseball for that matter, you know. Well, I think you're safe. absolutely right. I mean, look at football last year. Um, the, you know, the player that actually his heart stopped on the field, and that was such a huge, huge story, where our drivers and our crews, our pit crews, face that every weekend. I mean, sometimes I think we, we don't pay enough attention to the danger the crews are actually facing when they're out there. 
but it's real. And when I worked the North Pits at the Speedway my first year, you know, see a car come sliding down, and then we didn't have pits speed limit, right. so here comes Bobby Unser at 165 miles an hour. <laughs> hey, Bobby. Um, so, yeah, that, that's what makes it different, but it also is, to me, what makes it the special thing that it is. Um, the fact that there is danger there. Everybody accepts that. We're not real happy with it. We try to do a lot of things to make it safer, and I think we have been successful at that. But still, your kind of speeds you're talking about, and the drivers that we have who are, you know, they're going to drive it in there, and they're, they're going to keep it there. Um, there's always that monster kind of lurking on the other side of the wall. Well, you remember the day at, uh, with uh, Robbie McGee's car where Steve Free he got hit, Steve Freeze, he was dead for a moment, I think, if I remember right, he died, but came back, and look what's happened to him. The brakes failed for uh, Simon Pagino, and he's still out, yeah. still injured, and he walked away, and they said, how are you? He said, I've, I've been in worse shape with, you know, than I am now, and, and I drove, and he's still out. Yeah, I may not make it before the end of the year. Yeah, there may be, may be more to that than just yeah, that he can't drive. Uh, it may have become an incentive not to drive. I, I haven't talked to him about that. It's just some pure speculation on my part. Well, according to somebody said they contacted Mike Shank and said, is Simon out? And I said, he said, absolutely not. So, yeah, well, is of he course. Lying? I don't know. That's if, if I'm the owner, that's what I'm going to say, too. Of course. I don't want to show yeah. that. Well, of course. But um, since you're on that, um, I had more than my share of in race fatalities. Yeah. And that's that's just horrible. I, you know, I I, re I I remember I remember in one where our booth was alongside race control, and so Wally Dallenbach was literally on the other side of a piece of glass where you are, and we saw this accident happen, and both of us, you know, turned and looked. We knew that was a fatality, and this was Greg Moore. Yeah, out in California. You knew the minute you saw that. And I hit the talk back button from, so I could talk to my producer off the air, and I said, don't replay that. And he went along with that, and, and we knew what we had, you know, and it, but we couldn't do anything with it because it wouldn't have been proper. We don't know what family knows, we don't know what friends know, so you, you've got to hold up. And so you're sitting there trying to, act as if everything's okay and call a race because they did go back racing but still it, it, it's hanging there and um, there were a lot of shenanigans around that uh, by the uh, by the event organizers and and by I guess it was CART at the time I, I lose track of those sectioning bodies sometimes <laughs> but um, they had decided and they told our producer and he told me they were going to make a a show out of this. I, that's not the word they use, but they said, we're going to go yellow, and then when we get the field down and packed up, we're going to lower the flag at the start-finish line and bring it back up to half-staff, and then we will make the announcement. It's like, this is a human being's life. What are you doing? And that's when I, along with the producer, said, look, we're going after this. As soon as the hospital says it confirms it, we're going to confirm it. One, because we need to do that for the audience. That will tell us that everybody else knows and will get us away from this little act that they want to show, which really offended me. I was, I was pretty upset. Don't blame you. Uh, you were there in 64. Yep. And I just finished the book, I know it came out a couple of years ago, by uh, Art Garner, mm -hmm. Black Noon. Yes, that's an excellent book. Oh Fabulous. my goodness, that's a good book. Really if you haven't read that, you really have to really have to read it. And it starts with how Dave McDonald and, and uh, Eddie Sachs came, got in, and mm -hmm. got going. I mean, it covers the whole thing, but the whole book is about the accident. That's what it leads up to. It talks about uh, a phenomenal. And I understand he's writing another one. I, I don't know. I'm quite. sure he is. He he's, he loves racing, and he's I think an excellent writer. And he lives in California. Didn't he? Who knows? Well, I, he does. <laughs> well, let's ask him. I don't know. I don't know. I, he came to one program, but I didn't know it. Somebody, a friend of mine, said he talked to him. I said, why didn't you tell me? Well, you because you weren't handing out enough money. I guess that's the other problem. <laughs> did, you, did, you get, did you get enough? 
No, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. I'm, 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 I think I'm you. over. I think I owe you something. Yeah, well, you, you got water. What about what else you want? What about over here? Did, did, did you take proper care of him? Oh, are you kidding me? Oh, yeah. Good. <laughs> so you know, it's it's interesting that um, how your career has gone. From I'm sure as coming up, starting, you never thought you'd ever write a book. You wrote a book, and you probably said, "Well, there'll be you know 50 of my friends will buy it," and then instead it's gone crazy. I don't know how many. You know, 35 or 40 copies you've sold, but it's it's gone well. Uh, and I think I think you need to know, you don't get rich on a book. Oh no! <laughs> I just got a I just got a royalty check that covered the first quarter of this year, yeah. and it was for ninety dollars. Really? <laughs> so, go for it, huh? <laughs> Make that money. <laughs> Boy, you can go down but that's not why I wrote it anyway. Well, no. But I'm sure there's been more than one $90 check, and uh, mm. well, or two, <laughs> two or three. Mm -hmm. But it was worth to me to read the book was very interesting. And your view of what you saw and who you talked to and what they said and how you reacted to other, I found very interesting to read because as I have over the years barged in and gotten to talk to you know agents and <laughs> different drivers. To, Speaking of what a great guy Dan Weldon was, whenever I would ask him to come in, he would do it. And if you uh, was in Cal uh, down in Florida, he said, I'm going to be in town in such and such a time. You want me to stop by? Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. That was Dan. He was just that kind of a guy. And there are several that are like that that are fairly easy to get a hold of. Except now there's not that many live in town anymore. They all get on a plane and go to Florida or someplace. Oh, I think we're getting a lot of them living here now. Uh, starting, well, yeah, Erickson has moved here. There you go. Rehnquist. Uh, Rehnquist is living here. We got, we got people here. But we also have people leaving. Staunch, uh, there's somebody sitting here that has a 500 championship ring on his hand, and he's leaving town and taking his wife with him, which irritates the hell out of me there. Come on, stay here. What are you yeah, doing? <laughs> I'm talking about it, Gary and Lisa Miller, of course, moving to the, the what is it, the villages in Florida <laughs> to play golf. One-handed golf, I might add. The, Gary's going the epicenter going. of sexually transmitted disease. Oh. <laughs> In fact, I know I didn't make that one up because I have friends that live there. <laughs> really? Oh boy! I'm glad I brought that. I'm glad I brought okay, that. Okay, on up. to something else. All right. Um, you know, I, I I think you know for all your years in the business and all of the teams and drivers and sponsors and stuff you've talked to, you've got to have a minimum of 50 subjects that you could put stories together into another book that I would think would be very interesting. So I hope you do it. We may do it. Thank you. Thank you, Don. I appreciate that. And uh, does your wife assist you in any way, or is she still working this, uh, in the broadcasting world? She found out what it pays. Haven't seen her since. <laughs> <laughs> she, Sally, I'm writing this other book. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, she I Actually, I, I think I've got her talked into uh, edit, being the editor on the book. Which yes. will be great because she's an awesome writer, and you know, she's got her share of Indy 500 and all yes, racing yes. stories as well. I'm so, sure. Yeah, you know, getting thrown out of uh, like Andy Granatelli, or not Andy, but Vince Granatelli's pit because he was afraid of women, and then found out she was Italian. Now she's a paisan. It's best. Come on in here and sit. Enjoy yourself. <laughs> yeah, like, that, that, I think that would be a good combination. Yeah. Well, Paul and Sally. It would, yeah, it'd be fun. Well, I hope you do it. I do too. So, what's next on your agenda for you? What do you What do you spend the majority of your time doing? Cutting besides cutting the grass and maybe folding laundry or something. <laughs> um, actually, we have um, not that this means anything, but we have a big family reunion on Sunday oh, good. at my house. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm the hamburger and hot dog guy, mm -hmm. but uh, we've got about uh, about 20 people. Mm -hmm that are in the area, and uh, we haven't gotten together since COVID. So this is, that's kind of a good thing for me. Of course, watching and following to the end of the season, still trying to keep my hand in the game to at least have some idea of, of what is going on and who's doing what. That's why you know, I, I sit here and, and listen. You, I, why am I coming on after the Dean of Motorsports Journalists? I just, <laughs> that's where I go to get all my information. <laughs> So what what do you see for the series for either Indy Next or for IndyCar? What do you think they're doing right? Maybe they're doing wrong. What they can do better? They're doing good. 
What do you think? Well, uh, first of all, I, I'm really interested in where the whole hybrid thing is going. To the best of my knowledge, there are only two of them right now. Um, they're going to get some more. They're going to start testing with the hybrids. Um, but this is September, and you never know what's coming up in testing. I hope that there are no issues with it. It comes on. I mean, it's a lot heavier. It's it's requiring a lot of uh, different forms of cooling and things than uh, the current car has. So there's a lot to be learned about it, and I just hope that they get them in the team's hands as rapidly as possible so they can figure them out, test them, and get the thing going. So that's important. I'm kind of following that. Well, I think what, what you said is what they need. They need to get enough time to test. I mean, the test time they have now is, is brutally squat. Well, and there's been a, a, it's almost a yearly thing that there's some part that just isn't available until late February or something like <laughs> that. I don't want that to happen. That, that would not be helpful. Uh, the sport itself, it couldn't be better. I love watching all of it. Um, I have, I've gotten, well, I, I did it when I was, when I was working on the air, but I, I've always been into the tactics and, and what are going on there. In fact, I, I tried desperately and I think everybody else, Bob Jenkins, all of us tried to get our producers, you know, the New York guy that's only ever ridden in a yellow car, um, <laughs> and knows all about racing, um, to pay attention to some of the more subtle things that, uh, let me, what's a good example? This last, last race. You have a crash on the first lap. You have Dixon spinning through that. You have Colton Herta driving through that. Herta has to stop for a tire. The problem is that wiped out that set of tires. Yes. Now he's got to go to the blacks when that's not what they intended. Now their strategy is all screwed up. That's the kind of thing that just fascinates me. And watching what they did for Dixon, what a masterpiece. I mean, you could see it coming. If you, if you, if you get up there on the IndyCar uh, webpage and watch the timing and scoring and set it up right, you know, you see these little movements, uh, like in uh, the 100th race uh, with Rossi. I saw that coming um, because I'm looking at lap speeds. The rest of the booth, you know, to their credit, they're pretty busy looking at a race and trying to relate it to you. So I have the advantage of sitting back there and saying, that, that could be something. And I remember saying to, um, to Mark James, um, keep, keep an eye on Rossi. And he kind of gave me the look, you know, and this is a guy that really knows motor racing. And Hamilton kind of looked around at me like, you know, and we, uh, I had done that off the air. So then I did it on the air. I just, we really have to keep an eye on Rossi. And again, I mean, they were polite, but it's like, you know, Paige is crazy. Um, so. <laughs> Then when we see the cars peeling off and watching that whole last lap play out and knowing I'm watching on that last lap, the interval back to second place because Rossi's, Mark James had the greatest line in the world. He said he has just won the 500 at a blistering speed of 135 miles an hour. And that's what he crossed the line at. So, but you know, second place, you. A couple hundred more feet, that could have been an entirely different race. So well, I, like, I like looking at stuff like that. It's, it's interesting, and I think you're right. I think the series is picking up. I think that Roger and Mark are doing the right thing. Did they, did they ever bring in a new marketing person after S.J. Lecky went? I don't I've know. never heard a peep. Yeah, I don't know. I know, I, I don't know Allison that. took it over, but I don't know if yeah, she's still I don't. Ordered. I don't follow yeah. that. Truthfully, well, okay. You don't yeah. have to. Well, I mean, it's it's not, corporate. I'm more interested in yeah, what right. the, what the guys are doing in the shops. And I think that's where I hang. You know, uh, and, and to your point with Scott, watching how he, I was doing the same thing. Watching, I said, he's done this before. Come from last and won the race. And you watch, uh, and between his ability to manage his tires and his fuel, mm -hmm. and you think he's saving fuel, but he's still going fast. Mm -hmm. Why the hell he does that? And Mike Hall behind with the strategy, what a combination they are. Yeah, yeah. And I think to Chip's dying day, those two guys will be together as long well, as they breathe. Just think about what those two brains are in sync. Yeah. They, they really are. And you know, the, the, the guys that see, I've seen that before. I may have seen it 40 years ago, but I've seen that and I know what happens. That's what, that's the connection the synchronicity that they have that really makes a difference. And so you get a great race out of them, I guess, like Saturday. Yeah, it was Saturday.
It was Saturday. Yeah. Saturday. Yeah. So, there was a race Sunday. I, I, was I, I heard. Really? Yeah. I, I wasn't there, but I, I heard there was. Race cars don't have doors. Well, that's true. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to pay for that. <laughs> well, as Richard Petty said, I won't drive a car that doesn't have fenders. When Andy offered him a million dollars to drive yeah, the 500, right, he said, no way. Right. It doesn't have fenders. Yeah. I'm not here. They've got their thing, and uh, I'm, I just not, have never been, even when I'm, well, it's not true. Recently, last decade, I haven't been really interested. I was really interested, one, when I was doing NASCAR races, and when they were on the bias tire, where they could do so much with the car, and plus you had race drivers that had had some moxie to them. I mean, what I call the real Dale Dale Earnhardt. Uh, I, he was he was just a, a race driver through and through. He was tough. He didn't much care what other people thought. I mean, he, and that that whole group of those guys in that era. Let me let, let me tell you a, a story if I can. Sure. Um, about about Earnhardt, when we were covering the IROC, they were racing at Charlotte for the first time. And Thursday's a practice day, they had two cars that were practice cars and they didn't get to run in the cars that they would actually race in. So Rusty Wallace primarily was there and he's running the car and the other guys are running the cars and they're talking, they're talking. I'm sitting on the pit wall listening to all of this. and. They're all saying, well, that car, we can't handle it. That car is messed up. It's, it, and Rusty says, go get Dale. He'll know how to fix it. <laughs> so they go get him. Dale climbs in the car, goes out and turns like six blistering laps, pulls in, drops the net, climbs out of the car and says, that car is perfect, and walks <laughs> off. <laughs> is that not the greatest psycho thing you've ever done? <laughs> yeah, he was quite a guy. Oh, yeah. And uh, Bill Simpson did an investigation into his passing and found that what they accused him of was not true at all. He had nothing to do with it. And he said, I told Dale once, I told him a thousand times, you're too low in the car and your seat belts aren't right. But he wouldn't listen. Well, so, you know, I, I, I saw that accident happen. I, I saw it on television. At, my son was actually working at Daytona Speedway at the time because he was going to Embry-Riddle University. And um, I, I, I saw something, and I think if you would go back and look at that, Waltrip thought something had happened there too. It was just, it was that angle as that car came in and then snapped. And I'm not sure if he'd been tied in, you know, if he'd been welded in there, that it would have made a difference because that's one of those things where the brain just spins inside your skull. Um, so. I'm hesitant to point fingers at that one. No, and, and, they said, and my son called me these three hours later, and, and all he said was, we've lost Dale. Well, and, that, that was a know, and I really liked him. Yeah, he, he was fun. He was good for the sport. Yeah, he, was good. He, was, he was an interesting guy. If you get to talk to him, he would talk to you. But when, he, when they ran here, he'd come from his motor home in the garage area, which was pretty much close to the fans. It's not like the 500 where everybody and their brother's in there. But anyway, what is it about racing? Once you get into it, you can't get out. I mean, I'm still here. I should have retired 15, 20 years ago from this, but I am still love it. What is it about the sport that has kept you going? The people. Yeah, the agree. people. Um, the, sure, there's a lot of excitement. There's a lot of pomp and circumstance. But that community is so very special. And they take care of each other. It may not always look like it. Yeah. But they really do. And it, it, when I was doing drag racing, same thing. I mean, I, they just are very genuine people. And especially, you may notice, and kind of watch for it, driver might go, be going down behind the pits or, you know, cutting through uh, into the garage area. But if there is, and I've seen this a dozen times, like a, a, a young person in a wheelchair, they will go right to them. Mm -hmm. um, they communicate with them, and they care about that, and they care about their friends. And it was suggested to me that maybe that's because they all recognize, and they've seen it, that it could be over another half hour. Yeah. And so they don't want to leave. They, they want to make sure that everything's copacetic with everybody else. That's just my thought, but that's, the community is what really kept me going. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and 
all of the things that you hear in other sports of what players do with their wives or girlfriends and get into all kinds of stuff. I only know of two instances, and all these, I've been here since 64, or 63, or six, whatever it was. Uh, there's only been a couple guys, and one of them I think is still in the Huskow, I think. But otherwise, I mean, they might go out to the White Way and have a couple of extra beers. Mm -hmm. And I've seen guys at short tracks get an argument with a driver over a race and go after each other with tire irons, but when you get to the motel, they're out in the parking lot yeah. yeah. swatching parts and go race again to, to the next night. There's a lot of passion in this Oh, sport. yeah. It's, 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 it's a fun. The people in it, I agree, the people are what really attracts it. The, the excitement of the race is one thing, but it's the people that are creating worth knowing and seeing. Well, I hope you write, you and Sally write a book together. I'll tell her. And, and she'll say, who the hell is he? No, he, she didn't. Well, she was here with you the last oh, that's time. Right, yes. And she said, she, knows you well. she said, I'm not going this time. That's, <laughs> <laughs> See, that's not exactly how she put it. No. <laughs> She had something else going on. I, I see. Yeah, signing autograph somewhere. Well, I hope you get some more books, and one of these days we might invite you back with your summary of, uh, of a season or of an operation or some of the moves that were made, and you'll have some books. In case and by then, I books. may learn how to tell the truth on all of it. Well, Actually, kind of fun too. That's all true. That's the funny part about it. All well, that's true. Good. Well, I, I, I appreciate you coming, taking the it. time to be over here. Uh, I feel privileged to have. Hall of Famer to take the time to come and chat. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Don Kay. You are the best. Paul Page. <laughs> now, our next program will be, is scheduled to be the 29th of August. I just realized after three attempts what the date is. I have two scheduled guests. One is a guy that's a team owner, co-owner, and a lead owner. Uh, Ricardo Yunkos will be here of Yunkos uh, Racing. And some kid that used to be very popular as a driver and still is, Jimmy Kite. Yes. So if you have time, hope to see you. If anything changes, I'll let you know. And trust me, I will pay attention to when I send the message out of what the program is and what the date is. Somebody was, I was talking on the phone and they said, when's your next program? I said the 29th, so what do I type in? I take out whatever it was, I put 29th, and I forgot that it was July, it's no longer. I, I had to send that out and change it from July to August, so I'll try and do it right the next time. But thanks for being here. Thanks to Steve and Paul for taking the time to come and chat. Until the next time, Don K saying, thanks for being here, thanks for watching, see you again. Thank you.